For 22 years, I made myself believe that this disturbing series of events never happened. I successfully convinced myself that I imagined it all. Then I spoke with a friend that I hadn't contacted in a long time. He confirmed the whole thing. We went through this together. I'll do my best to accurately present the entire story just as it happened, because apparently it's all true. The story revolves around a Ouija board. I hate to even say or type those words. I haven't touched one since 1997. I was 13 at the time, an age when most of us like to investigate the curiosities in the world around us. It's no longer just having sleepovers with friends, playing various video games or getting into high school sports. Girls were starting to become appealing. This was a time when professional wrestling was just starting to really take off, and a group of my friends were diving into horror movies and scary stories. This is something that always appealed to me. Ever since reading scary stories to tell in the dark, I was hooked. This series of books came out when I was about 8 years old. They sold them at our Scholastic Book Fair. Looking back, these stories and illustrations were way too intense for 8 year olds, in my opinion but I sure did enjoy them. We all like to be scared. We like to feel something more than the everyday mundane drudge of life. My friend Philly and I enjoyed getting together to watch horror movies and scare each other with urban legends. We started doing this almost weekly, especially during the summer when school was out. Of course, this was pre-internet, so all we had media-wise was actually renting a movie or physically going to the theater. And since most horror movies were R-rated, we couldn't get in to see them. I'm sure to most millennials or post-millennials, this sounds like a nightmare scarier than any real-life story. Because we got tired of renting the same movies over and over, we often focused on urban legends, what we call creepypastas today. We might find some books at the library that had them, or we just made up our own. But we really wanted to feel some actual terror. I wish we would have just stuck with our stupid, scary stories. I bet every group of friends had one of those Parker Brothers board games stashed. The infamous Ouija board. Just a simple game. A toy. Really. They even used to advertise it. A board with the alphabet. Numbers, yes, no, and goodbye. I suppose this was inevitable. Every kid has to learn for themselves that these are not to be played with, literally and metaphorically. Growing up in a God-fearing family, I knew this felt wrong. There was something about this board that just wasn't right. I also could see through the marketing strategy that Parker Brothers were targeting these specifically to children, like all board games, but this was different. They only wanted kids to play this, not adults. You played Monopoly and Shoots and Ladders with your parents. You sure as hell didn't play the Ouija board with them. I felt this was wrong, but I also didn't know anything for sure. I was 13. My current 35-year-old self has a hard time understanding what happened and why I dove into this, knowing that the outcome would not be ideal. I found it, my buddy Phil said, under my sister's bed. This was the start of a series of events that would haunt me for quite a while. It, of course was the board. We made sure no one was home when we pulled it out. There was an air of mischief around this thing. Certainly we couldn't deal with his sister finding us in her room, and definitely not Philly's mom finding out what we were up to. The board was glossy and new. It looked like possibly we were the first to use it. The device that two or more people used to glide over the board, revealing the answers to your questions, was almost ivory. I wanted to research what this was called, but I don't even want to start down that rabbit hole online. If you've noticed, I don't even want to call it by its name, simply referring to it as the board. I'll call the gliding thing the oracle for this story. We had only two sessions with the board. That was enough to keep me away for 22 years. The first session was incident free. We asked a few silly questions, what our future held, if we'd get married and have kids, stuff like that. 
Even though I'd never played this before, I still knew not to ask certain questions, like what was the name of the person we were talking to? Maybe we figured that out from all the hours spent watching scary movies. It was the second session when things got weird. Philly and I were going back and forth with the board, asking simple questions about our future lives. I remember asking where I'd live as an adult, and the board said Seattle. I was living 2,000 miles away from Seattle at the time. This is when I felt the aura of the board shift. The air became static, like a thunderstorm was brewing, one where the sky turned red. The oracle we used to piece out answers to our dumb questions had moved slowly before. Now it was jerking almost skimming off the board as it flew to the next letter. I can tell you this about the game. It is real, and neither one of us was moving the oracle. My hands weren't even on it at some points, but back to the Seattle question. I was, and I still am, a huge baseball fan. I have rooted, unfortunately, for the Detroit Tigers for my entire life. The mid to late 90s was the explosion of Ken Griffey Jr. to Major League Baseball. I loved watching him play. I got his jerseys for a couple Christmases and birthdays. I'm sure most people know that Griffey played for the Seattle Mariners. I loved how that national S looked on that teal colored uniform. I started researching the city of Seattle, and I thought how cool it would be to live there. Do you see where this is going? This board was not plastic and glue to me anymore. There was something controlling it. Something powerful and dark that knew I had this particular city on my mind at this time. I didn't let on to my buddy what I was feeling. He didn't seem to let on that he was afraid either. So we kept going. The next round of questions is a blur to me. All I remember is the oracle going mostly to no when we asked a question, even if it wasn't a yes or no question that was required. Then I asked the last question that I would ever ask the Ouija. Don't get your hopes up. It was nothing profound or deep at all. This is what I asked. Would the Detroit Tigers ever win another World Series? The oracle moved so fast to goodbye I thought a tiny trail of fire would be on the board. I'll never forget looking at Philly and seeing what I'm sure was the exact same eye bulging mouth open expression that I had on my face. We knew that one of the rules of this game was when the board said goodbye, you put it away immediately. I think we even read about that in the instructions. We threw the board into its box, hustled to his sister's room as fast as two Hostess Cupcake and Mountain Dew filled teenagers could. Philly chucked the board under her bed, like nothing happened. After a few breathless moments, we finally started to let out tiny little laughs, lighting up into big belly laughs as we hit the floor rolling. We were laughing out the nervousness, although kind of feeling dumb at how scared we got. After the madness finally started dying down, we moved on like nothing happened. I should have stated, right from the beginning, that it was late at night when we started playing. I'd say it was about midnight, as cliche as that is. When the board said goodbye to us, it couldn't have been more than one in the morning. Philly lived in the country, across the street from a cemetery. I know, now it's really getting into cliche territory, but I swear it's true. There weren't many houses around. If you wanted to walk to your next door neighbor, you better plan for a good 20 minute hike. Well, finally we started to get tired from playing video games and we decided to step outside. We looked at the graveyard, noting how calm the night was. A large section of Philly's house was covered in rose bushes. They were wildly overgrown and not kept up. Needless to say, Nothing would be able to get through those bushes without getting pretty diced up. We heard rustling. Again, the night was calm and I don't remember any wind at all. At first, we could just hear the bushes. Then we heard movement. To this day, I do not know and I do not care to know what it was. It could have been an animal, but I highly doubt it. 
We knew something wasn't right, and we bolted for his house. Even now, writing this, I can feel an eerie presence. We both knew somehow this was related to the board. Philly suggested we call it a night and try to get some sleep. I wish that was the end of the story. Just a few short hours later, we woke to a series of faint knocking sounds. I couldn't determine where they were coming from, but it sounded like it was outside the house. We both cautiously got up and moved through the kitchen to the front door. I slowly peeked outside and saw something that made my heart drop into my stomach. A man was standing right outside the door. He had creepy looking horn rimmed glasses on, outdated even for the late 90s. Philly had a porch in the front that was raised about five feet up from the ground, and the man was on the ground, so we were actually looking slightly down at him. It's an image that's burned into my mind. He didn't move. He just stood there. We once again fled to his room and slammed the door shut. We didn't call the police or his mom. We just sat in the room not sure what to do. After a few minutes went by, we stupidly decided to go see if he was still there. He was gone. I successfully convinced myself that there really had been no man outside the house. I just couldn't handle what was happening. Philly did the same. Finally, day broke and we dismissed the disturbing events of the previous night. I don't even think we discussed what had happened. About a week later, I got a call from Philly. He said he had a dream that we were playing the board and a hand came up from the center and reached for his head. He said he tried to push himself away from the table, but he was moving in slow motion like when you're trying to run away in a nightmare. The fingers on the hand were long and spidery. The skin was ashen gray. They skittered slowly up his face, lingered over his eyes, then grabbed a fistful of hair. Philly tried to scream, but no sound came. The hand began forcing his head down into the surface of the board. As Philly's chin was pulled through, it felt like the bitter cold of outer space. And when his mouth and nose disappeared into the board, all of the air was sucked out of his lungs. He couldn't breathe. He woke up gasping for air and felt pain on the top of his head where the thing had grabbed him. I hated to admit that, but I had the same dream. Right there, we decided to meet up and make a plan to get rid of the board. A few days later, my mom dropped me off at his house for a sleepover. When I arrived, Philly wasn't inside. This was before cell phones, so I didn't have the option to simply call him and see where he was. I checked out back by the garage, and there stood Philly with the board sitting atop a pile of kindling in a metal barrel. His mischievous grin told me what his plan was. We lit that sucker on fire. Nothing happened. Now I was really freaking out. We've all heard the stories of people attempting to burn a Ouija with no success. Philly wasn't phased though. He pulled out a jerry can full of gasoline and doused it. Finally, the board erupted into flames and quickly burned to nothing but ash. It was over. As far as I can remember, nothing happened after that. We never spoke of anything we experienced that night. Over the years, I chalked it all up to an overactive teenage imagination. I may have told a handful of people once or twice, mainly just to tell a scary story around a campfire. I know that I've said this a few times, but I've always treated this like it never really happened. To me, this was all imagined. We did play the game, but the rustling bush, the man, none of that happened. Over the years, I've moved quite a distance away from Philly. We kept in touch, one of us calling the other a few times a year. Ten years ago, I even made the thousand mile trip to go see him. Fast forward another ten years, and I decided to make the trip one last time to see my hometown and get together with Philly. 
he invited some people from the area and struck up a massive bonfire. In between bites of pizza and swigs of beer, I recounted the story of that night. I told him how I imagined the aftermath of our decision to use that board. I know you're going to think this is crazy, but I thought there was a man standing outside your house that night. I said, Philly looked at me as stone cold as he could and said, yeah, I remember that too. I remember it all. My blood went cold. My friend went on to confirm exactly what happened that night, word for word, just like I remember. It was like we were both back there again, 22 years ago. The Ouija is nothing to play around with. I haven't touched or looked at one in over two decades. How a piece of cardboard can summon some kind of evil from another realm is beyond me. But I know it can happen because it happened to me. Transcript of an interview conducted by Detective River Hawthorne of the Toronto Police Service with Hector Keith regarding a hit and run on September 16, 2021. Transcript provided without the consent of the Toronto Police Service. This is not an official TPS document. Detective Hawthorne begins. Mr. Keith, I'd like to remind you again that this interview is being recorded. Anything you say from here on out will be on the record. You understand? Yeah. Yeah, I understand. All right. So on the record, I am speaking with Hector Keith. Is that correct? Yes. All right. You entered our station at seven o'clock this evening to turn yourself in for the hit and run that occurred on Palm Street at four o'clock this afternoon. Correct? Yes, th th that's correct. All right. So why don't you tell us a little bit about what happened, Mr. Keith? Where do you want me to start? At the beginning, Mr. Keith. At the beginning. Right. Right. I take your time. Thank you. I, I feel like I'm about to try and justify something that I can't, you know, trying to explain what happened, what I did. Look, it wasn't my fault, okay? I know how that must sound when you put everything into context, and I know that nobody is going to listen to me, but it wasn't my fault. Multiple witnesses said you accelerated your vehicle when you saw Michael Newell enter the road. You're contradicting that. No. I... God... Look, I don't want your side of the story on record, okay? You came in here. You didn't make us look for you, so I'm willing to give you that. But you have to talk to me. And you'll believe me? Why wouldn't I? I wouldn't believe me. Try me. All right. Okay, at the beginning then. The kid, you said his name was Michael. Michael Newell, yes. He lived in Toronto, right? In a house on the street where I... Yes. I've seen him before, a few times actually, but he wasn't in Toronto. What do you mean? I've seen him on the road before, in other towns, other places. I've been working from home ever since COVID. It's been an adjustment. I'm used to the commute, you know? That was... It was my time alone. I'd sort of just de-stress listen to music or my podcasts and let my mind wander. If I was going through some shit, that was kind of my time to relax and think it through, kind of like meditating. Then 
the world just shuts down, keeps everyone indoors, and there goes my commute. Okay. I didn't actually expect it to hit as hard as it did, but I guess you never know what you're going to do in a situation until it happens. I don't know. Being cooped up like that, I could feel it messing with my mental health. I got all stir-crazy, unfocused, needed to get out. So, I figured, why not try going on drives? Maybe it would make things a little better. So I started doing it. Every now and then, when I was feeling particularly stir-crazy, I'd just get in my car and drive for a bit, stop off at a fast food place or a convenience store and get a drink, then pick a direction and just start driving. You know, you'd be amazed by the things you find when you do that. Scenic back roads, charming little towns. There's all sorts of things out there, and most of it is barely even an hour from home. It helped. All that shit I was feeling, all that shit, it just sort of melted away while I was driving. Usually I do it at night or early in the morning, less people on the road. Every now and then, I'd turn it into an extended lunch run or something, though I don't know, it was just an escape. That's all very fascinating, Mr. Keefe, but let me stop you right there. What exactly does any of this have to do with Michael? It's how I started seeing him. Sorry, sorry, I'll try not to ramble, just nerves, I guess. Keep it to the point, please. Right, right. The boy in the road, that kid. The first time I saw him, I was more out in the country. I'd been going for a while. I think I was out near Cambridge, maybe. Wasn't close to home, though. I was looking for a way to get back onto the highway, to head back home and cut through some suburbs. I'd just gotten myself a root beer and was listening to one of my podcasts when I saw him. And I saw him long before I even got close. He was on a sidewalk a short ways down, playing on somebody's lawn. He looked to be about three or four and had short blonde hair and eyes so blue that I could clearly see them from down the street. I didn't see any parents or anyone watching him, which struck me as a little odd. But hey, he wasn't my kid, and so he really wasn't my problem. And it was the same boy you saw today? It was Michael Newell. Yeah, yeah, I'm pretty sure it was him. I slowed down, of course. I mean, little kids are unpredictable, and I didn't, I didn't want to. I slowed down, okay? Just like on principle. I didn't actually expect him to run out into the middle of the street, but with no one to stop him, that's exactly what he did. I was still some of the way down the street when I saw him run out. I had plenty of time to stop, so I did. He was probably a good 20 meters or so away from my car. And he just stood in the street and he watched me, looked right at my car and he had this shit eating grin on his face, just grinning from ear to ear. I don't know, it kind of weirded me out, sort of felt like he was goading me or something, like he was basically just saying, come on, hit the gas, do it. So what did you do? I just waited until somebody got him the hell out of the road. I mean, he was just some dumb kid. Probably didn't even know what he was doing. I was expecting some concerned parent to run in and snatch him off the road. But nobody came. He just stood there grinning at me for Christ it must have been four or five minutes long enough to be really weird. Did you try to go around him or turn around? I didn't want to move. I mean, he was just standing there, staring at me. If I moved, maybe he'd have moved too. Eventually, he did move. I don't know if he got bored or what, but after a while, he just ran off to the other side of the street. I didn't see where he got to, though. Maybe he got into someone's backyard. I see. So this kid from Toronto just ran out in front of you, in Cambridge, correct? Look. I know how it sounds, but that's what happened. When was this, roughly? August, I think. August 2020. August 2020. You're absolutely sure that it was the same kid? I'd know him anywhere. You ever see him again? 
more times than I'd like. Saw him again about a month later. It was in town this time though. I wasn't out on one of my drives, just headed to my aunt's to help her with some computer shit. I wasn't busy, and it wasn't far, so I just figured I'd pop over, help her out, and be on my way. You're a real saint, Keith. So what, Michael Newell was sitting on her couch eating cookies and milk? No, don't make fun of me for this, okay? You said you'd believe me. Yeah, okay, okay. I believe you. So, where was Michael Newell? He ran out into the road in front of me. Same drill as last time, although this time I didn't see him in someone's yard beforehand. He just, he just sort of appeared. Ran right out into the street, like before, from behind a parked SUV. Then, same as before, he looked right at me. Looked me dead in the eye through the windshield, and he was grinning. And then what? Well, I stopped, obviously. Stopped a little too close for comfort, but I stopped, and... God, I looked at him, and I recognized him. Like, I remembered him. He'd spooked me before. This time, though, you were scared of him. Damn right I was scared. I thought I just missed hitting a kid. That was twice now that some kid had just run out into the road, as if he'd had a pressing meeting with Jesus in five minutes that he just couldn't miss. Didn't help that he looked exactly the same, even that smile. God, that smile. I think that's what made me realize that it was the same damn kid. I didn't want to believe it at first, obviously, but just looking at him, he stared at me, just like he had last time, wearing the exact same smile as before. Just like last time, I sat there waiting him out. I don't think he stood in front of my car as long, but I don't really remember. All right, so what did he do next? Same drill as last time. He ran off, and I just sort of felt shaken for a bit. And he came back the next month, too, right? And the next, and the next. No. 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 He came to my apartment. See, this shit in my car that I could just try and hand wave as just nerves. I mean, it shook me up a little bit, sure. But I figured it was just two different kids and a really screwed up coincidence. Then, about a week or so later, that's when I start seeing him outside my window. My apartment's got this balcony, and I go out there to read sometimes. It's peaceful, you know? Sure. So, one night about a week or so after I saw the kid for the second time, I'm out on the balcony reading. I was taking a break, having a smoke, and... Well, I look down, I look down, and there he is, standing in the street, the same damn kid. I'm up on the seventh floor, but I can tell you without a damn doubt that it was the same kid. How could you tell? The hair, the shirt, I'll bet he was even smiling too. It was him. I swear to you that it was him. All right, so what did he do? He just, he just starts walking. Soon as he knows I've noticed him, he just starts walking and heading into the front door of the apartment. There's no way he should get in. You need a fob to open the inside set of doors. But about 10 minutes later, I start hearing someone knocking on my door. So I go. I take a look through the peephole, and the unsupervised toddler who somehow was stalking you was standing at your door. Yes. Damn it. Yes. He was right there. I saw him. He was standing right at the door, and he had this grin ear to ear. I'd never seen a kid with that kind of creepy ass smile. It didn't, it didn't look right. It was like it was too big for his face. Right. So, what did you do? I locked the door, and I got the hell away from it. 
I kept hearing the knocking, though, getting louder and louder every time until I swear it was shaking the door itself. I just, I just crawled into bed. I crawled into bed, pulled the covers over my head, and I waited for it to go away. Uh Uh-huh. So when did he come out of your closet? He was there. You don't believe me? No, Mr. Keith. No, I do not. What I currently believe is that you're either making up a very elaborate lie to somehow justify the fact that you murdered a three-year-old boy today, or that you've suffered some sort of psychotic break. You want me to believe this? Where's your proof? Do you have a photograph of Michael Newell standing at your door? Do you have any proof that he was the child you saw on those other two occasions? I don't know if you've looked around lately, but there's a lot of blonde toddlers in the world today. Seeing some children running out into the road is not justification for you to run one down. I have proof. You you should have the police report because I have proof. I told the officers what I saw when he tried to kill me. Excuse me? Look it up. There has to be a file. December, I I had an accident. I saw him again then. He ran me off the road and I told the police what I saw. I told the doctors. I told everyone. I see. Why don't you tell me about the accident then? I was out, up at a Christmas party with an old friend. I was headed back to the highway along some back roads. When I saw him, it was dark out, a little snowy, but I was good to drive. They checked my blood alcohol. I was sober, hadn't had a drop all night. I was on the back roads. That's when I saw him. There's this bridge. It's narrow and goes over a large pond. I drove over it, and when I did, he just came out of nowhere. One minute, the bridge was clear, the next he's running out into the middle of it. I swerved, went right off the bridge and into the water. I see. I… my car went through the ice. Didn't flood at first. I was freaking out, but I thought that maybe I could find a way out. Tires wouldn't move though. They just spun. Water started leaking in, couldn't get the doors open against the weight of the water against them. I couldn't get out. I was trying to think my way through it, but I thought I was going to die. Clearly you didn't. No, but I was there for a while. It was dark out, sometime in the early morning, maybe one or two. The water was freezing, kept flooding in through the doors, slowly, but it The cabin filled up fast. After a couple of minutes, it was moving up my legs. Didn't get much higher than my chest. The pond wasn't that deep, but I was still stuck and I just sort of… I struggled for a bit. But the best I could do was get my seatbelt off. I couldn't break the windows. Couldn't do much about the flooding. Couldn't open the doors. I was just stuck. I remember I looked out the windows a few times and he was there standing right at the edge of the pond, smiling that same damn smile. He was there, watching me, waiting on me to freeze to death. You're certain that it was him? I've told you enough times, detective. I'm certain. I don't know how I made it. The doctors told me that I ought to be dead. I sat there for maybe two or three hours, though. Dark, cold, alone waiting to die, and the whole time that kid was staring at me. The only time he left was when the other car found me. Even then, I'm sure he was still around, watching from the shadows somehow. I see. He made me crash. He made me go into the water. I told the police that. They took my statement. I swear to you that I saw him that night. I see. Was that the last time you saw him? For a while, yeah. Spent about a month in the hospital. Lost a couple toes. Didn't drive much after that. I couldn't. Didn't go out on the balcony either. Every now and then, I'd hear a knock on my door, but unless I was expecting someone, I didn't answer it. 
Just in case it was him. So, what changed? Why were you on the road today? I felt restless. I started driving again a couple of months back, never really went far from home, just in case. But I haven't heard any strange knocks on my door since March, haven't seen anything strange. I figured, I don't know, figured I might finally be in the clear. I figured that he was finally leaving me alone. And then today, I'm out for a drive and a little blonde boy runs out in front of my car and smiles at me. The same little blonde boy I saw a year ago. The one who nearly took my life. He ran out into the road and I, I hit the gas. Did you feel as if he was going to hurt you again? Yes. Yes, I, I did. It wasn't until I looked into my rearview mirror and I saw a woman running out into the road to check on the body that I, that I started to second guess it. Then I started to panic and I, you fled the scene. Yeah, I drove away. Didn't stop driving until I ended up here. I couldn't, I couldn't go home. Because you knew you'd murdered someone. Yes. And when I looked in my rearview mirror, I saw him in my back seat, covered in blood, same as he was when I hit him in the street. I saw his corpse, and it was grinning at me. Same wide grin from ear to ear. I saw him in my back seat, and I, I can't, I can't do this anymore. Okay, I'm going to stop the tape now. Sit tight, I'll be back shortly. End of recording. The audio that this was transcribed from was sent in the following email. From Detective River Hawthorne to Jane Daniels. Jane, I recall a little while back, you mentioned you knew a thing or two about ghost stories. I had this interview with a hit and run case a month or so back. I figured the story was bullshit, but the guy seemed pretty damn shaken. Last I heard, he was in a psych ward. Model patient, go figure. The thing is, I'm not so sure this guy was lying anymore. Couple of weeks after this interview, some kid ran out in front of my car. Not quite like the guy described. Brown hair, overalls, and really intense blue eyes. Similar idea though. I didn't think too much of it until about a month later when I saw it again. Then again, two weeks after that. Look, I'm trying to look at this with a healthy dose of skepticism, but I swear to God it's the same kid. There's something else too. In the interview, Hector Keith mentioned that the kid he saw had blue eyes. Maybe it's nothing, but I've gone back and actually taken another look at the pictures we have of the victim, Michael. And I can't help but notice one little thing. His eyes were brown, not blue. I could use some input if you've got the time. Signed. Detective River Hawthorne.